It is 1.30 in the morning, and you wouldn't know it from the perfectly clear sky, but there is an insane light display going on above my head right now, and today I'm going to show you it. Today I'm going to be showcasing some spectacular images of airglow over New York City that I captured with a very special type of infrared camera. This video is going to give a bit of an overview of the hardware that I used to capture this, uh, some of the image processing that I used to make a final product, and some of the other projects that I've done with this camera that I'm hoping to make future videos on. To give a sense of perspective and context to these images, I went ahead and made this animation in Google Earth. This is exactly where I took the image from, and I've gone ahead and rendered in uh, airglow at the appropriate height, and I've added this orange circle representing a part of that airglow that we saw in the image. If we zoom out to the height of an airplane, you'll notice perspective-wise not a whole lot changes, and that's because airglow is way higher than like high clouds, for example. You would have to go all the way up to the height of the ISS before you even got on top of it, and that's because airglow is in the mesosphere, which is kind of a no man's land in the atmosphere. You'll see in this image uh, provided by NASA that there's quite a few layers of airglow in the atmosphere. They're not all caused by the same phenomenon. Um, but the one that I'm imaging, I believe, resides at about 85 kilometers up. Which would mean that orange circle I overlaid would be about 300 miles away, which is the distance to Virginia Beach. I made that circle the diameter of Manhattan, which really gives a sense of scale when I'm looking at this image. lights that you see buzzing around are actually airplanes, and I think the lights on the plane are responsible for the majority of their brightness, but also the hot engines are probably glowing in this part of the infrared as well. Also notice there's a lot of stars, and that's because a lot of the LEDs that we use today don't emit light in this part of the infrared. I imagine it didn't quite look like this a decade ago when there was a lot of incandescent lights in New York City, but today it's pretty amazing just how little light pollution there is in the shortwave infrared where this image was captured. I was pretty shocked by how many stars I could see, so I decided to point the camera straight up where the sky was the darkest. Absolutely mind-blowing. It's as if I'm in a totally dark spot when in fact I'm in the center of Manhattan. I was even able to capture a couple of galaxies, although I didn't have time to process those photos to show it. I'm definitely going to have to make another video that goes into astrophotography in the urban environment. I was also able to spot a lot of satellites with this setup, most of them in low and medium Earth orbit. This one in particular stood out to me though because it has this very unusual arcing path, and I was hoping to hear what other people's thoughts were on it. Airglow is an emission of light from the upper atmosphere, much like aurora, except it has a different mechanism behind it. The airglow that I was capturing I believe was related to OH emission. Basically what I've read is water dissociates during the day to create OH and then recombines with O3 at night to create this glow. Typically, airglow looks something like this. It takes a lot of skill and luck and being at the right place at the right time to get a spectacular image. Whereas in my case, pretty much every time I set up, I saw something incredible with this camera. The reason for that is the camera I'm using can see beyond what a normal camera can see, into a part of the infrared spectrum called shortwave infrared, or SWIR, where the majority of airglow emission takes place, at least from the hydroxyl radicals. I have to say, shortwave is one of my favorite parts of the infrared, and I've been trying to access it with a silicon CMOS for a very long time. And you can push them pretty far. With the IR cut removed, I was able to get my Sony A7S out past 1150 nanometers, where water starts to turn black. And while this is really cool and technically swear, it's nothing as crazy as the other absorption band of water at 1450 nanometers, which is beyond the range of my Sony camera. And that's just related to the smaller band gap of INGAS. If you want to see this part of the shortwave infrared, INGAS is one of the few sensors out there that can do it. When I finally bought my first INGAS camera, it was a mind-blowing experience. I quickly made it portable with a USB power supply and a monitor that could record. I could see invisible features in this painting that I couldn't see with my eyes. 
I used it for this project that involved a seven channel sphere light source, which I programmed with an Arduino. The Arduino would send a series of PWM commands to the light source, which would allow me to change the intensity and the frequency of the flashes and the sequence of the flashes all at the press of a button. This allowed for really cool color fusion of sphere images. I could even make this thing portable with a battery. The Goodrich camera worked great for this purpose, but it did not work that great for the Airglow project. I quickly realized that it had way too much noise for this to work, and I threw every image processing technique I knew at it. While my Sony camera had better noise specs, it had way worse QE out past 1100 nanometers, and I just couldn't reach the wavelengths I needed to do this project. I had to be like two inches away from a heat lamp to take this video. So with my old camera out, I decided rather than buying a bunch of cameras and returning them, I had to create a simulator to let me know what to look out for. I was pretty much solely searching used merchandise on eBay for these cameras. This simulator produced what I would expect the image quality to look like from the camera. It generates an image based off of noise specs from a camera manufacturer, which fortunately are kind of standardized. It was created on Excel using conditional formatting. Here you can see a bright target occupying four pixels against what should be a black backdrop. It takes into account the pixel size, the dark current, the read noise, bit depth, the well depth, the maximum exposure time, the QE, all while changing gain settings and exposure settings on the virtual camera. And then it generates a pixel value with the correct amount of randomness added to it to create a simulated image. It can then apply image processing to and then compare side by side different cameras to see which one performs best for this task. One of the cameras that fit this bill was the Goldeye G33, the tech cooled version of it. And fortunately, it was available on eBay, so I quickly snatched it up. Of course, not without getting a great deal first. It came with this really crappy C mount lens. This is not a sphere optimized lens. I did have a sphere lens from the Goodrich camera. It's actually not bad for the price. You can get them on eBay for like 150 bucks. It does have some serious aberrations though and some bad problems with glare that prevent me from using it for this project. However, even with this lens, the new camera worked beautifully. I could finally capture 14-bit digital sphere images on a 640 by 512 sensor. Anyway, I did a bit of searching and I was able to find this F1.3 Stingray Optics sphere lens on eBay for a good price. So I snatched that up as well, which meant I could finally get to work creating all the other components for this project to work outdoors. Some of those components included a 3D printed filter holder assembly. The design was pretty simple. An SM1 filter is basically sandwiched in between these two halves. And then I melt those little tabs so that I create a solid piece. I also had plans for a baffle system, but fortunately the Stingray optics lens performs pretty well when it comes to glare. I imagine it has a pretty good field stop in there. And lastly, I 3D printed a housing that allowed for cooling fans. Those of you who do astrophotography are probably familiar with dark current. It's particularly bad with in-gas cameras. It's a fixed pattern noise that increases exponentially with temperature. Fortunately, this camera has a single stage thermoelectric cooler in it, which makes the dark current stable so that I can subtract it, but also gives me some cooling abilities. And since there's a hermetic enclosure around the sensor, I can bring the temperature down well below the dew point without any risk of damaging the sensor. In the cold January weather, I was able to easily get this thing below minus 20 Celsius, even minus 30 Celsius, which is about the temperature that their more expensive two-stage tech model runs at. Here is the Goldeye Swirk long pass filter on here. This is a Viz Sphere lens, which means it brings all the wavelengths specified there to the same focal point, which is great for Viz Sphere imaging, but it's actually a problem with this type of in-gas sensor because it has an indium phosphide layer on there that fluoresces under exposure to visible light, hence IR pass filter. This filter was meant to prevent that fluorescing, which would ruin an image. It actually created an interesting and kind of annoying problem, which was etaloning. I did a bit of investigation and tried to correct this, but uh, here I have a monochromatic light source. This is a mercury lamp. The fuse around here, the lens um, is on there just as it was the other night. And you can see when I change focus, these rings pop in and out of existence. And so I tried a number of tests with targets at infinity, long exposures to figure out what the cause of these rings were. I thought maybe they were reflections or something. Those rings there are interference patterns basically taking place inside of this um, optical system. The bummer is, is that when I change focus, also when I change the wavelength of light, it changes where those rings are. Um, so reproducing the pattern that we saw the other night is going to be potentially quite a big challenge. Do your flats in the field. If I had done a sweep across the sky um, and basically averaged all those frames together, it would have given me the pattern that I was looking for. Um, but now that I'm back indoors, I have to see if I can make a, a way of reducing it um, with the light sources that I have. Uh, if not, I'm going to have to go back outside and take a couple flats later. 
So far, I haven't been able to correct it, so I'm just gonna show you the images. So the power supply to the fans is isolated from the main power supply to prevent electrical noise. This is the ethernet cable that I run this uh, data feed to the computer with. Um, this is the 12 pin high rose connector and then soldered this together after looking at the pinout for this connector. Uh, this camera is not reverse polarity protected so really had to make sure I got that right. The battery pack, it's a lithium polymer battery. Uh, could power this camera for over 15 hours. As I mentioned before, InGas has pretty crap noise specs compared to a silicon CMOS. However, a lot of the image processing techniques I used for astrophotography could be applied. First, I take a dark frame, which I can use to subtract off the fixed noise patterns caused by dark current. Now that we have a cleaner image, there's still some dead pixels to deal with. So I opted to make my own dead pixel replacement mask in Photoshop to make it the least aggressive I could get away with. The mask allows me to do a replacement only on the pixels that I deem necessary, which prevents a lot of the stars from being removed from the image. You can see the process isn't quite perfect. There's still a lot of dead pixels that remain, but at least I have the flexibility of individually identifying pixels. Some of the automatic noise reduction algorithms do a lot of damage to the stars. It is a bit tedious to process 20,000 images in Photoshop, even with the automated batch processing feature. It takes a really long time to create a finished product. The trickiest part has been identifying the problem pixels without having to individually select each one. I've tried many different methods to identify them, using flat frames and dark frames, really long averages over the course of the night, and I've pretty much exhausted every one of the mathematical functions in Photoshop. One of the techniques that surprisingly proved kind of promising utilizes a software called Slicer, which is free to download, and I believe it's open source. It's generally used to process medical images. I actually used this software in the past when I was building a 3D ultrasound scanner. You can see how it assembled a series of images to create this 3D model of my leg. Fundamentally, the software just allows you to take a series of images and make it into a 3D object. And my images of the sky have both time and spatial components to them, which I can then assemble into a cube. If you slice this cube perpendicular to the axis of the stars, you can actually get them to stay relatively still over an impressively large field of view, while the noise and dust on the sensor just moves across. One of the thoughts was to just average these frames together to create a better image. If you slice the cube along the time-spatial dimension, you can create these amazing panoramic images where the camera is essentially acting like a line scan camera. However, in this case, it's acting like 512 line scan cameras. And if you slice it at somewhere in between, you can capture these mind-blowing panoramic videos that actually capture a moving subject. Panoramas that extend past the field of view of the camera, which I'm of course sweeping. Anyway, this project has been one of the coolest projects I've ever worked on. I've seen a lot of insane stuff now. I just didn't really know existed. So I really appreciate your time and I hope you guys enjoyed this project as much as I did.